and we're live. My guest tonight is one of the hardest workers in the tabletop role-playing game industry, by my definition. <laughs> a writer and developer for multiple editions of Dungeons and Dragons, several excellent Planescape source books, the creator of the Tolus setting, his own take on the world of darkness, Arcana Unearthed, and the Diamond Throne. He is also the owner of Mal Havoc Press and Monty Cook Games, a writer of fiction and non-fiction, short stories and comic book graphic novels, a frequent attendee of conventions, and perhaps most importantly at this current moment, the creator of the hugely successful via Kickstarter Numenera and the uh, Tides of Numenera, Torment spiritual sequel video game. Cook, to the Monty, I guide you to gaming. Welcome, gentlemen. And so now, without <laughs> the chaos speak, <laughs> Monty Cook, I welcome you to the Gentleman's Guide to Gaming. Well, thank you very much. It's a very nice introduction, and I'm really happy to be here. Yeah, it's um, yeah. Without um, trying to inflate your ego too much, I do genuinely uh, consider you one of the greatest contributors in the last um, well, 25, 35 years now, I suppose it is, uh, to the role playing game industry. Your your products, um, well, the the sales can speak for themselves. I think there's uh, a hell of a lot of work that you put into games like Dungeons and Dragons, and of course your own um, versions of the uh, well, of the most popular fantasy game that well speak volumes for your your fan base, those who just admire your work, even if they don't necessarily play the games. I know of players who attend my clubs who pick up various of your products because it's got your name on it and I think in such a niche industry as we exist in that is saying something so yeah I say that quite honestly and Monty I would like to start by asking you for a history lesson um, namely how did you get into gaming and subsequently the gaming industry well um, I learned about uh, RPGs and, and Dungeons and Dragons in, of all places, uh, Sunday school. I was uh, about uh, nine years old, I think. And, uh, yeah, and uh, I, I heard these two other kids, and they were talking about something having to do with graph paper and a weird trap and a magical crown and I didn't know what they were talking about but I heard enough to know that uh, you know I wanted in uh, I, want, I wanted to know more this is something that was you know was was going to be really important to me so uh, I latched on to them very quickly and, and joined their game and that would have been in about 1977 so they would have uh, <clears throat> we were still using the the, the little brown booklets, um, as they're called, for original Dungeons and Dragons. Um, but when it came time for me to uh, start my own game and, and purchase things, uh, my my first uh, the first game that I owned was Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, uh, so that had been first edition. Um, and I played D and D for a, a long time throughout uh, high school and. Uh, I started playing different games as well. I, uh, we played a lot of uh, a superhero game called Villains of Vigilantes and uh, a little bit of Traveler and Gamma World and a, a wide variety. We were, we were very much samplers. We tried a little bit of everything. Um, and by the time I got into college, uh, I, again, I was still playing a lot of different things. I was playing a lot of Call of Cthulhu, um, and uh, a, a, a wide variety. I was starting to experiment with my own game systems at that point, um, which is actually something that I started doing very early on, actually, because I lived in a little tiny town in the Midwest, and I didn't have a lot of access to to game materials, and so I was frequently, um, you know, I would find an ad in Dragon Magazine for a new game, and I would. Uh, send away for this game, but it would take weeks to get there, and so I would be impatient, and I would start sort of designing that game that I had just ordered on my own. And anyway, so uh, by the time I got to college, I had already done a lot of that kind of work, and had been 
playing around a lot with a game called Rollmaster, which was uh, a game that uh, was published by Iron Crown Enterprises. And uh, to make a long story short, I, I got hooked up with Iron Crown Enterprises uh, by a friend of mine who went to a convention and told them about me and some of my work. And so I wrote two books for them while I was still in school. And uh, when I graduated from college, I went directly to work for them and basically uh, have been in the game industry ever since. So, you know, I've never had a real job. <laughs> what did you do your degree in? Uh, I have uh, degrees in ancient history and creative writing. Yeah, well, you put them to good use then. <laughs> I, I figured that was sort of the Dungeons and Dragons degree, so... <laughs> yeah, very much so. And, um, well, the first time I really saw your name hit the map was through the run of Planescape, one of my favorite campaign settings for Dungeons & Dragons 2nd Edition. We discussed it briefly before we went live. And Planescape is without doubt my favorite campaign setting, both due to the flavorful writing and the wonderful artwork by uh, Tony DiTalizzi, among other artists. Right. How did you come to work on Planescape? And what did you take away from working extensively on that setting in the uh, mid to late 90s? Well, um, I had just started working at TSR. This, this would have been in 1994. And I think it might have actually been my first week. And when you're an employee at TSR, when a new product comes out, uh, people, uh, someone uh, in the office comes around and gives you a copy. So you get a copy of everything. And I think it was the very first week I worked there, and it was on a Friday, and, and someone came by and handed me this strange-looking grayish-blue box set, and I didn't have any idea what it was. And uh, I, I opened it up and was just utterly blown away by it. It was like nothing I'd ever seen, particularly nothing I'd ever seen for Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, and that box set was, was written by Zeb Cook, uh, who had the office next to mine, actually, um, although he left TSR pretty quickly after I got there. Hopefully that wasn't my doing. <laughs> well, I've um, had a rumor. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, uh, as soon as I got that box at my hands, I sort of devoured it, and I said, I am, I am going to work on this setting, and I'm going to do whatever it takes here at TSR to, to sort of worm my way into that group. And uh, fortunately, that didn't take very long, and the first thing that I worked on was... Uh, a book called Planewalker's Handbook, which uh, is a book I'm still really very proud of. And uh, probably pretty much from that point on, I worked on Planescape almost continuously for the next couple of years. And uh, let's see, you asked the takeaway. The takeaway was that um, you can, you know, I think up until that point, you know, with 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 Planescape and and maybe with World of Darkness and and some of the other things that were being produced by people there in the in the mid 90s, I think that was kind of an explosion of of where people decided that we really can take these games in a lot of different directions. And I don't just mean by genre, but by approach. Um, you know, we can we can do things in different stylistic ways, and we can we can approach even the way we write a product in in different ways, and explore different and original sorts of things that way. So, uh, you know, ever since then, I'd like to think that I'm I've continued to explore new ways to present the information that we see in an RPG product, and and make it not only entertaining to play, but entertaining to read and, and participate in, even just as a, as a, as a reader. Yeah, I, I, I would be inclined to agree. Um, I was discussing Videodrome quite recently, and one of the things Videodrome is supposed to have is a, a philosophy, and Planescape and the World of Darkness had a philosophy. They were games in which you had to apply serious thoughts to your character's actions and in Planescape alignment, his his religion, his well, his basic beliefs, his core principles, and it became very political, which was wholly new for Dungeons and Dragons. The mm -hmm. idea that you could well, you could alter the entire fate of, of a town in the Outlands or indeed Sigil itself 
just through belief alone and and self belief in some cases, well, depending on what faction you belong to. And right, right. with that being that being the case, would you say that it was perhaps a little too that way, too uh, much the, um, veering towards the political side to hit the target Dungeons and Dragons audience? Um, <laughs> uh, I think perhaps the the people uh, whose job it was to to sell the products probably would agree with you. Um, <laughs> Uh, it was not a. It was not an extremely popular uh, setting. Um, it, it, it's funny now because you know people. I, I think much more so than some of the other settings that were coming out at the same time. I think people remember it more and talk about it more because it was so strikingly different. But at the time, the sales were very, very modest. Um, I often wonder sometimes if products like Planescape don't actually suffer because they appeal to, I think, the people who are really, really creative and imaginative. Now, of course, I mean, all, all role players are creative and imaginative, but I think that there are some products that seem really focused on those people, but the very problem with that is is that those people are the people who don't need to buy a lot of products. You know, so you can, uh, you know, you can buy the Planescape box set and 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 suddenly start creating all your own adventures and come up with your own imaginative planar ideas. And so there wasn't, you didn't need to buy every adventure that came out and whatnot. Um, I don't know. That that's I, I wonder that sometimes. Um, but uh, it, it might have been too different at the time. Right? It might have been kind of a, a shock to the system. For, for some D&D players. I know that, I mean, I remember that there were lots of D&D players who, you know, kind of had the reaction of, what have you done to my to my planes, you know? Um, so, yeah, the, re the, the reaction was definitely mixed. Yeah, I, I have encountered players, GMs, who, who would look at a box set like Planescape and ask, well, what do I do with this? It's almost too much of a sandbox. There's all many, almost too many options, and maybe there's something to be said for enforcing some limitations without advertising that there are some. But I think Planescape is one of those settings that's looked back upon favorably. It's it's kind of it's D and D's Wraith the Oblivion. It's one of these games that's looked back 20 years later and really appreciate it, and pro possibly that's why it commands such high prices when you look for Planescape products on eBay and, and Amazon and wherever. But would that be, with the um, modest sales, be the larger reason for why Planescape wasn't carried over as a campaign setting by Wizards of the Coast when they took over and 3rd edition was implemented? Absolutely. Um, they, just, it, they, they just couldn't justify uh, justify things with the with the poor sales. Um, from from a Planescape point of view, it's very unfortunate that the line ended where it did, which was sort of in the middle of of sort of this grand story arc where we were kind of shaking things up in the setting. Um, so we sort of left things unfinished, but uh, there there was nothing we could do about it. Would you revisit it if you could? Obviously, Numenera is is uh, taking some of that philosophy with it. But uh, it, if Planescape was suddenly re recreated, and and you were invited to have some kind of consulting development role in in that, would you? Do you think you would be interested? Um, in that aspect, in that specific situation, probably I would. Um, and that, that's. Purely out of out of the affection that I have for the setting, um, my own company, Malhavic Press, uh, we did a, sort of a, a Planescape tribute product called uh, Beyond Countless Doorways. Yes, yeah, so I'll be getting on to that one. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, we gathered as many of the old Planescape team together and uh, put put that out for for D twenty. Um, so I mean, I, I do still have a very strong attachment to it. Um, I'm I'm not as interested in working on 
uh, you know, shared properties or, or you know, some, something that someone else has created anymore. But but that one I probably would would want to have uh, some some touch of. Well, the history lesson continues where you worked <laughs> on the development of Dungeons and Dragons third edition, of course, which as a result brought in a new golden age of gaming. To what extent did you develop? D and D three, and what are your memories of the experiences? Are they fond ones? Um, they are very fond. Um, in fact, well, it, it, it's almost it's almost difficult to imagine how they couldn't be. Um, you know, if if you if for for almost three years, my job was to sit in a room with uh, two or three other people and just talk about D and D. Um, I mean, you know, of course there was, you know, we had to write the books and everything at the end, but I mean, the vast majority of that was just us discussing the way we thought it should be and, and, and looking at the past and thinking about the future. And uh, so, you know, I was, I was involved with the creation of third edition from the beginning. Um, at the very beginning of the process, it was uh, uh, Skip Williams, Rich Baker, and myself. And... Uh, later on, uh, Rich left the the team, and Jonathan Tweet joined the team. Uh, Jonathan, of course, was uh, the lead designer uh, by the time he came on, and um, you know, so it was it was the three of us, Jonathan and Skip and I, who probably spent the most time working on things, and together as a as a trio, and. So that was that was like I said, the majority of that was the three of us working together on the system as a whole. And then when it came time to actually produce books, uh, we we divided them up. You know, there are three core books with uh, Jonathan doing the player's handbook. I did the dungeon master's guide and skipped did the monster manual. And uh, um, you know, so um, I I would like you know I, I'm very very proud of that. And, uh, and, and, you know, the fact that many, many people are still playing that game today makes me, or in some variation, um, makes me very happy. Well, you, uh, you've certainly, you certainly showed your happiness through the extensive work you carried on with with d and <laughs> uh, Not just for Wizards, of course, while you uh, developed variants such as, uh, I think it was Ghost Walk, wasn't it, with Sean K. Reynolds? That's right. And uh, and your own Arcana Unearthed, and that was uh, via Mal Havoc. Mm -hmm. And you identified things that perhaps you would have changed in Dungeons & Dragons or alternatives for players and GMs to use. Would you say that's fair? Yes, um, more the latter than the former. Um, you know, it, it, it's the kind of thing where... Um, even 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 working as one of the three designers of third edition, um, the third edition that came out wasn't precisely the game that I would play. Um, I mean, even from the get go, I had my own little sets of house rules and and things that I tweaked and whatnot, um, like everyone does. I think that's I think that's very healthy actually, uh, no matter what game you're playing. But. Um, uh, you know, but but that doesn't that isn't meant to be like a statement like, well, third edition was clearly flawed, right? I think that I, I don't believe that to be the case. Um, so what I would do is I would provide different options for people. You know, Arcana Unearthed um, was not meant to be something that would supplant people's D and D's D and D games, but to give them an alternative. You know, here's a different way to do things. Um, and uh, and and that that seemed to th there seemed to be a lot of like-minded people who who uh, embraced that as well. I mean, there are some people who who they just want to play the game as canon, right? And who will you know they'll they'll email they'll email the game designer and they'll say you know exactly how is this supposed to work. And, you know, because I, I only want to play the very most official version of the game. And, you know, I, I try to help those kind of people out. But most of the time, you know, I'm not 
particularly sympathetic to that point of view because I think that the real answer is, well, it should work the way work that works best for your group. Um, so giving people lots of options, um, I think, helps facilitate that. Well, the three Mal Havoc books that really stand out to me um, the, through, through the uh, series of books that I've purchased and read and played with were Beyond Countless Doorways, as we've already mentioned, uh, the Tolus campaign setting, and the Diamond Throne, which was, of course, an expansion on Arcana Unearthed. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little about the development of those three products and what you love about them and what you might have changed. Well, the Diamond Throne was uh, very near and dear to my heart because uh, I, I really wanted to create a setting and, uh, and, and really kind of build a system around the idea of, of playing Dungeons and Dragons for all intents and purposes, right? I mean, we're calling it D20, but, if, you know, that's what everyone's doing. Um, at, but, but doing it without the standard fantasy tropes, without the strong Tolkien influence. And that, that isn't to say that I don't like Tolkien and I don't like elves and dwarves and those standard fantasy things. I love them, right? And I've been playing with them for 30-some for years. But, uh, but I don't think that that's the only way to play. And so the Diamond Throne was an opportunity to create a place that didn't have elves and dwarves. It didn't have clerics. It didn't have a lot of those things that we sort of we, we sort of begin to think a fantasy setting has to have, right? And so uh, I, I look at the Diamond Throne as a way to show people, no, you know, there are many different ways to play this game. Um, and let's see, uh, Beyond Countless Doorways, uh, as I said before, was really very much a way for me to just get together with all my old Planescape friends and, and be wildly creative again. The, the sort of the design uh, approach of that was we're going to talk about planes, we're going to talk about, but, but we don't have the, the great wheel cosmology to play around with because that, you know, that's Wizards of the Coast owns that. So what we're going to do is we're just going to latch on to the, the very imaginative aspect of, of Planescape, right? Those, those crazy wild ideas of, of um, you know, the most imaginative settings that we can think of, and we're going to put that together all in one book. And, and so that was, that was wonderful, um, getting all those people back together again and those creative minds and great writers and editors and, uh, you know, we even had the introduction and uh, it, it, was, it was wonderful. Um, very, very proud of that book. And then let's see, the third that you talked about was Talus. Um, and again, I'm going to use the phrase near and dear to my heart when it comes to that because that actually was my personal D&D campaign that I had started um, before 3rd Edition actually came out. Um, so in many ways, it was sort of the longest-running 3rd Edition campaign because, you know, we were playing 3rd Edition within, in Tolis without, uh, before, the, before the books were actually published. And, 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 and many, many of the concepts got playtested in Tolis. Um, and, uh, and so that book was, was special to me because... I realized that I was going to be publishing this book that had so much information in it, and it was going to be very challenging for a game master to use this. And so I decided that I had to kind of rewrite the. I, I kind of had to rewrite the rule book on how to write a book like that. Um, it, it 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 couldn't just sort of present it with, you know, two columns of text and the occasional little piece of art and a map here and there and call it good because we're, you know, we're talking about a, a book of, of uh, you know, 600 and some pages and, and whatnot. So what I did was, um, or I should say we, my editor and I, uh, looked at travel guides and we kind of threw out the standard way of, of doing a role-playing game setting and instead presented Tallis as though it was a travel guide to a place that doesn't exist. Um, so that's why in Tallis you've got the, the margin uh, notes 
that give references to everything that's mentioned in the text. And, and every time an important term is in the text, it's in a different color so that you know that there's going to be a margin note about it. And every, every page of the, uh, that's talking about something that is uh, in the map, if you look up in the corner, it tells you the page that that map is, right? That's, that's taken directly out of uh, DK travel books. Um, you know, and we, we, even the kinds of art uh, where, you know, we would show a location and then show, like, smaller breakout il, uh, il illustrations of things in that location, right, look exactly like something that you might find, you know, if you're looking at a, a, a sort of a, a pictorial map of the British Museum or something that's broken out into little sections and, um, you know, uh, yeah, I'm really happy with the way that that material is presented. In fact, uh, so happy with it that I now think that that's really the only way to present setting information. Um, so that's the way that uh, Numenera is laid out as well. Well, funny you should mention that game. <laughs> <laughs> because we have reached the present. And just before we get on to the present, anyone watching this live, and I see there's quite a few of you, uh, if there are any questions that you would like me to ask Monty during the course of this interview, if we have time for it, if the uh, question is respectful and relevant, I will uh, do my level best to ask. We already have quite a few questions banked uh, that were posed in my uh, video a few days ago, but if you've got something you're dying to ask Monty, then please do put it in the comments on the video. As it's going live, I'll check them if we get the time. So, Numenera. Well, firstly, it is an immensely exciting product for me. It calls back uh, everything that I love about fantasy, science fiction, plain, yeah, Planescape as a setting, Eberron in that kind of technological way, high fantasy in, in the way that magic through science seems to be layering the entire world. What is your elevator pitch? For Numenera. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the elevator pitch for Numenera is that it is um, it is a setting in which the characters uh, discover the wonders of the the distant past to to build a better present and a fu and future, and those wonders are incorporated. Uh, well, those wonders are best summed up by Arthur C. Clarke's quote, you know, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And so even though, you know, it is a science fantasy campaign, so the what we're talking about is actually sort of science, um, you know, it, it really expresses itself more like magic, you know, when, when we've got nanotechnology and and, and crazy uh, uh, biotech and, and genetic engineering and, you know, sort of unimagin unimaginable to us uh, levels of technology um, that can do really anything that magic can do. What does it offer to the role player uh, that existing products do not? Um, I think it. I think it offers two different things. Um, one is is this this setting that strongly emphasizes uh, the sense of wonder and the weird, and uh, you know a, a setting where you know you go over the next hill and and literally anything could be over there, and and so it is. It is the the whole game is based around. Discovery. In fact, that's that's how your character gains experience in this game. That's how your character advances is through the discoveries that they make. And so, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of of the really imaginative fiction out there. You know, whether you're talking about old school, you know, Moorcock and Vance and Wolf, or or newer writers like Mabel or or Grant Morrison or these people who just fill their work with with ideas. I love that, and I want to I want to give that kind of experience. But also um, the the game system itself um, 
it, it empowers both game master and player in ways that I think are, are somewhat unique in, in, for the players in the way that they have control over how their character interacts with the world, um, in that the character decides how much effort they're going to put into an action, and the character then decides this action is more important to me than that action, and so I'm going to give myself a better chance of succeeding. And that you don't see that. It, there are other games that have, have sort of played around with that a little bit, but but um, you know it, it, it's it's probably the strongest part of of Numenera. Um, and from the game master side, uh, I've done my best to sort of take away a lot of the. Uh, I'm going to use a heavy-handed word here um, that that probably overstates, but the drudgery of being a game master. Um, and, and tries to alleviate as much of that as possible so that the Game Master is much more freed up to think about the story and the characters and, you know, the, those kinds of things that actually make the game memorable. Would you say it is, uh, it is very much a character-driven game, then, rather than there being, well, global uh, forces that are manipulating the characters, let's say, or pushing them in a certain direction? It is more down to the individual or the party, may I suppose. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, it, yeah. Sorry, carry on. No, uh, you know, it's, it's very much about both player and game master being able to, to tell a compelling and interesting and fun story. Um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, obviously, as one of the people who created uh, uh, third edition D&D, &D, um, I am a fan of of you know sort of tactical gameplay and and you know combat and interesting things like that I'm, I'm not gonna pretend that I'm not but at the same time um, I'm also a huge fan of, of the fact that role-playing games are essentially a joint storytelling uh, exercise it, it, uh, it is you know it's the reason why most of us actually gather around the table and, and, and actually do these things, right, is because we want to be a part of some amazing story. And I think that Numenera, it, at least for the way that I play the game, um, facilitates that. And, and it doesn't actually have a lot of the sort of tactical gameplay and, and in-depth mechanics and whatnot uh, that, that you do see um, in, in other games. It, but that isn't, meant to, that isn't meant to be an indictment against that. It's just meant to be another option. Okay. Uh, uh, well, when do you anticipate Numenera shipping, I suppose? Uh, obviously, the Kickstarter is concluded, and you can pre-order the game as well. Uh, via your friendly local game store. You can. Um, it should be in game store shelves on August 14th. Um, Kickstarter supporters and backers will uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, have their copies before that. Um, but it probably depends on where in the world you are and, and you know, the vagarities of shipping. We won't take it as a guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> well, following on from Numenera, there's there is, of course, the video game Torment, the spiritual sequel to Planescape Torment, and what a wildly popular game that is. And again, probably a game that's reflected upon with great admiration more than it necessarily received immediately upon its release. I think that's fair. What can you tell us about this video game that's also been successfully funded? In fact... Would I be right in saying it was the most successful Kickstarter for a video game at its time? I think it still is, quite possibly. Uh, yes, I, I believe so, yes. Um, uh, the, yeah, the Kickstarter was wildly successful, and that was, that was a lot of fun. Um, so, um, uh, I'm trying to think, what, what can I tell you about it? Um, it is... Uh, I'm excited. Uh, I'm very excited about it. I'm, uh, in fact, I just got done with uh, a three-day meeting down in California uh, with the, the design team. Um, I am 
uh, I, I sort of play, I sort of wear two hats, I guess, uh, you might say, when it comes to uh, the Torment game. Um, it, because it is set in Numenera uh, and uses Numenera mechanics, you know, as a starting point, I mean, they're, they're going to design the game so that it is the best game that it can be, but they're kind of using Numenera as a starting point, and, uh, and, and I'm very happy about that. Uh, and so I am, you know, I, I'm sort of the guy who uh, looks at all of that and says, you know, yes, that, that definitely is true to Numenera. Uh, but at the same time, I'm also uh, going to be writing part of the game. And uh, and that's also very exciting to me. It's something that I haven't done. I, I've done a little of, but not very much. And so uh, it's a fantastic group. Uh, the lead designer is Colin McComb, who also worked on Planescape. Um, and I worked very closely with him for a lot of years on Planescape, and and uh, and he you know worked on on Torment, uh, the original Torment. Uh, Chris Avalone, who is the lead designer of the original Torment, is also one of the writers. Um, Pat Rothfuss, the the novelist, is involved. Um, there's uh, just a, a long list of, of wonderful and talented people, and it's uh, it's very exciting. It is. Uh, as, as a fan, I can attest to the fact that it is very exciting from both camps, then. And, uh, well, can you tell us anything, then, of the plot of the video game? Without stepping on any toes, what, what, is, what is the basic outline? <clears throat> what is... Um, I, I, I don't know that, actually, I, I am at liberty to talk about that, but what I can say is that it is a very... You know, it... When they were when when Colin and and the rest of the guys at at an Exile Entertainment say that it is a spiritual sequel to Torment, um, it, it that really is that isn't just lip service, right? It's not just the name of the game. They really are being very true to the original game, even though it's not actually set in Planescape. Um, and 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 so yes, the the. You know the main character is is not the same, and the situations are different. But there is definitely a, the spirit of the original in everything that is plotted out, and at every step of the way, you know, we're talking about you know how that compares to the original game, and what was done in the original game, and how those two things become fused together. And it's uh, it's 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 going to be really cool. I'm sure I'm sorry, I can't give you more details. No, no, that's quite all right. I'm sure we can expect to see some Easter eggs throughout the game that uh, little Ignis dolls or, uh, or a lost <laughs> <not drum. laughs> Um On to the viewer questions, as we have 20 minutes. We have 20 okay. Minutes. Uh, Gaming Beast 82 asks, what does, and this may be a question you may not be able to answer, what does Monty Cook think about the third Dungeons and Dragons movie, The Book of Vile Darkness? I'm guessing he's asking because of your involvement in the book. And were you involved in the making of the movie at all? Uh, I was not involved at all. Um, I, I actually only found out that they were making a Dungeons and Dragons movie called Book of Vile Darkness maybe a, a, a few weeks before anyone else did. Um, and so I had nothing to do with it, no input. Um, and I haven't seen it, so I don't actually oh. have an opinion to express. <laughs> There's a character called Monty Cook in it and everything, no. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's not true. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Uh, also, um, do you think live-action movies and or TV series based on D&D fantasy settings, or indeed fantasy settings in general, could work? Um, and is there any such in development that you're aware of? We'll exclude Game of Thrones from that, so which is fantasy. It does have dragons in, let's be honest. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I think there are many great examples Um you know, there's uh, you know there is Game of Thrones, but there's you know the Lord of the Rings movies and and The Hobbit, and uh, I I think that there's lots of room for for fantasy settings in in live action. Um, I, I also I am a big fan of animation, and you know would love to see more effort put in that direction as well, with maybe some either some licensed or some original fantasy uh, 
uh, undertakings there as well. I'm not aware of, I mean, I, I don't have any special insider knowledge of, of things in development in that regard, but, uh, but I'm a big fan. Tom Ray has multiple questions, some of which we may come back to. Mr. Cook, anyone who has been following the progress of Numenera could not help but notice that it has been shaped not only by you, but also by lead artist Kieran Yana, and especially lead editor Shanna Germain. How has Numenera been influenced and enriched by their contributions? Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, so, uh, both of them have been involved since the very beginning. Um, uh, Shauna has, I mean, Shauna was the lead editor, but she also um, did some writing uh, and contributed to the setting a bit in, in places here and there. And, uh, you know, was was definitely my sounding board for all the different ideas and, and helped, you know, t so fundamental, you know, that, you know, she helped me come up with, you know, things like the, the names of the character types, you know, the, the Glaive and the Nano and the Jack. And, and uh, uh, I, I wouldn't even actually kind of know how to begin to express how, how fundamental uh, her involvement has been. And then Kieran, um, you know, Kieran was someone that I worked with uh, when I was uh, doing a lot of Malhavic Press projects and kind of got a peek, uh, you know, and so there was, there was a few years uh, where we weren't doing Malhavic Press and Kieran was doing his own things and, and uh, uh, I, I kind of came back to Kieran's art and, and took a peek at what he'd been doing and, and as great as it had been, it had become even grander. Um, and so uh, he was my absolute first choice for someone to help me develop the visual style. And it was not, you know, it was not the typical relationship between RPG writer and artist that is often the case, uh, where the RPG writer often just says, would you please draw this, right? It was much more, actually, perhaps not coincidentally, it was very much like the relationship that Tony Dieterlizzi had with Planescape, where Tony and Kieran, um, were given much more free reign and just said, can you, you know, with these parameters, right, this is what the setting is about, now give us some some beautiful artwork, right? It was it was that open-ended. You know, I, Kieran and I had some discussions early on about some of the uh, visual influences that I had, like Mobius and uh, some of the other uh, uh, French... Uh, artists that were working along well, at the same time uh, as Mobius and uh, you know uh, Geiger, H.R. Geiger and, and a few other things and you know he took that and, and developed something wholly original which is really wonderful. Okay, Multicarious has two questions. First one is what's the weather like where you are? It's beautiful. Um, it's uh, Seattle summers are, are kind of a well-kept secret. Uh, it really does rain as much in Seattle as, as people say, but uh, it's all in the fall and winter and spring, and then the summers are beautiful. I, I was over in Seattle for a full February uh, a couple of years ago, and it rained on only one day. Oh, really? Only one day. Yeah, I was very disappointed. <laughs> That's an odd thing. Chicago, Chicago, it was humid as hell and wasn't windy in the slightest. So. <laughs> uh, Multicarious also asks, what's your favorite creature so far in Numenera? Oh, wow. Um, uh, I am, uh, I'm going to say, I'm actually going to pull something from... Uh, not from the Numenera core book, but uh, from the first adventure, which is something called the Insidious Choir. The Insidious Choir being an, an intelligent virus that uh, is, is so, ha has advanced so far that it no longer thinks that inhabiting biological creatures is a very efficient way for a virus to, to propagate itself. And so it's building its own artificial bodies to inhabit. 
that's my favorite so far. That 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 does sound pretty good. Uh, Mister Six 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 asks. He says, "I'd like to know your thoughts on magic systems. I don't really like the Vancian magic system in D and D Pathfinder. I know that Monty has been involved in D and D editions with this system. I also know he had a good crack at adapting the mage system for D twenty when he did Monty Cook's World of Darkness." So, I'd like to know where he stands on this. Does he prefer one magic system over another, or would he do something different given the chance? Uh, you know, I, I, I'm mostly just a big lover of magic in general, so uh, I, I, I am a fan of the Mancian system, um, and, and I, I, I have a difficult time thinking of D&D without it, but... I also have enjoyed, you know, point-based systems. Uh, I, I, I'm actually very, very happy and proud of the uh, the system that is in Monty Cook's World of Darkness. Um, you know, with which is basically a, a spell building system, so that a, a character can can create the spell he wants to, and and uh, uh, that it. I love that as a as a feel. As a wonderful way to make magic feel like magic, um, I think that's the that that's the thing that I think is probably the most important thing when it comes to to magic is 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 injecting that sense of wonder and mystery and you know as much as possible in a game where you have to sort of define the parameters of things to not define the parameters of it. Which is uh, an oxymoron. It, 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 it's, a, it's a contradiction, <laughs> but uh, you know, we do what we can. Uh, back to Tom Ray, who asks: When developing Numenera, what were the challenges in creating a world where super advanced technology plays the role magic would in a traditional fantasy setting? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I I I missed the part of that. Okay, so uh, when uh, yes, when developing Numenera. What were the challenges in creating a world where super advanced technology plays the role magic would in a traditional fantasy setting? Um, probably the biggest challenge is to make it seem like neither one of those things. Um, I didn't want it, you know, in, in Numenera, you know, you don't you don't pull out your blaster pistol and shoot somebody with it. Um, because that's that's Star Wars or Star Trek, and you know that it's not that kind of of science fiction. But at the same time, it's not quite magic either. And the tricky part there is you've got to make it so that it is uh, it, 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 it is both science, but but you can imagine that the people experiencing it could easily explain it away as magic. And and so it's almost like in a in a very odd way um, from a game design point of view, you know, you you create things like uh, you know I am going to attack another character at long range, and uh, that expresses itself through game mechanics and dice and bonuses and whatever the game system you're talking about, and then you you paint a veneer over it. You know, so if you're writing a fantasy game, you paint this sort of fantasy veneer over it, and so it's a it's a magical wand, and you have to say this incantation and and whatever. Um, and if it's a science fiction game, then you paint this veneer over it of you know this is some technological you know energy blaster or whatever, right? And Numenera kind of you have to give it two veneers, um, and so that's that's an interesting challenge. And, uh, you know, uh, we probably don't have time for me to go on and on about this, but, uh, you know, it, it, it is something where, you know, Numenera itself, because it is sort of the synthesis of, of these two things, it has its own unique sort of feel. And so ultimately what we developed was a, a, a specific Numenera veneer, to keep using this analogy, um, that kind of paints over everything, which by the end of the design process was its own thing, rather than just simply of, oh, make it look like magic and technology. I don't know. That's very big terms, but uh, hopefully hopefully when the game comes out, you'll see what I mean mm -hmm. about there being a unique sort of 
Numenera feel to things. I'm going to uh, throw some quick fire questions at you now. Uh, Master okay. Merrick firstly asks, uh, what is your go to game? Uh, well, right now, Numenera. Um, and I suspect that to be true for a long time. Mark Williams asks um, a cutting question Is Tolus basically a dead product now that Wizards of the Coast no longer support 3.5 edition of the game, or are there plans? Uh, it is it is not dead in that it is still uh, uh, it is still available and there are still lots of people using it and playing it. Um, uh, there are no plans for future Talos products. Okay, uh, Oisin McColgan asks: Is there room for any Lovecraftian elements or creatures in the Numenera role-playing game? Absolutely. Well, that's always good to hit. Well, it's not, <laughs> not for the player characters. Uh, Mr. Melek asks, what is your favorite Dungeons & Dragons setting and why? Uh, Planescape uh, for its uh, imaginative qualities. Brynja Sigerson asks, what is your favorite module that TSR published and what is the fa your favorite module that you wrote? Favorite module that TSR published? Um, you know, that's the kind of thing where if you ask me the question today, I'll give you one answer and I'll give you a different answer tomorrow. Um, but, you know, I've been playing this game for a long time and I probably have to go with something like the Vault of the Drow. Ah, uh, classic. Um, my favorite that I worked on uh, is that's very, very difficult. Again, the kind of thing where you'll get a different answer on a different day, but. I will say dead. No, I was going to say, yeah, mine would have to be dead gods. It's a, <laughs> it's a perfectly polished Planescape product, and yeah, perfect entry level. That and the Great Modron March for me, I think, um, just fit together so perfectly. Uh, this is BHM wants to know whether have you have any writers, RPG developers such as yourself or any of your colleagues thoughts about storytelling through or a story driven experience on mobile devices? Um, I probably um, <laughs> I, I don't know of anyone who's doing something that is solely mobile but um, for example we are developing uh, a, a map uh, or rather an app for uh, 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 iOS and Android um, platforms that will be usable with Numenera that will kind of facilitate character creation and, and whatnot. Okay, Jessica Pink would like to know why is why is Intimidate a charisma based skill? <laughs> <laughs> um, because uh, because charisma is is meant to be not just how likable you are, but your force of personality and. Uh, 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 that's the best way to express it in in that particular game. I believe in 3.5 uh, you did have the option of strength slash charisma. I think you could use strength instead, but um, let's see. Uh, that one's not really a quick-fire question. The casual DM, suggestions for novice setting and mechanics design. So something, an entry-level uh, game for the casual DM. Um, well, you know, uh, I hope it doesn't sound too self-serving, but I've actually designed Numenera to be very friendly to the new person. Uh, and it's very easy to be a game master, much much easier than than most games, I think. Okay, John Benet uh, Gacy, um, no relation, I hope, would like to ask, where did you get the inspiration to write a book as grim as the Book of Vile Darkness? Was it your proposition that had it written? Um, it, the answer to that is sort of, um, because I had the idea, I wanted to just do a book of, of demon lords and, and, and devil lords and, and, that, and, and just kind of focus on that aspect of the game. Um, it was the idea of other people to kind of turn that into, you know, just all things... <laughs> really, it, 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 it didn't even become a book of all things evil. It became a book of all things that we can't put in any other book. Brenton Babcock would like to know, well, like to say, Numenera was revealed in a relatively short time after you left the D&D Next project. How much of Numenera evolved from your ideas for D&D Next? 
Um, the, the answer to that is not very much um, because the real truth of it is is that Numenera was what I was thinking about working on and then I was approached by Wizards to come back to Next. Um, there's Numenera and D&D and &D of any edition bears very little in relationship to each other so it very much was the kind of thing where I had to put some ideas on hold and then focus in on D and D because you know D and D always has its own. You know when you're working on on D and D, especially in uh, an edition of the rules, you've got to kind of put yourself in this particular D and D sort of mindset and uh, and serve those the needs, the very unique needs that D and D has. Uh, the Gorkan Mork, and I think uh, you probably answered that by uh, explaining your work on Numenera. I would like to know whether Numenera was the reason you left work on D and D next. Um, I actually can't really get into uh, my my leaving Wizards of the Coast uh, this most recent time. Uh, that's absolutely uh, fine. <laughs> fine. Okay, and uh, let's see. Oh, uh, Garnishing Owl would like to know. What so far has been your favorite player character made in Numenera during your testing? Oh wow! Um, uh, there is uh, in the, in the current game that I'm running, uh, a player has created uh, uh, an old character, which is which is interesting because you normally don't think of a beginning character as starting out old, but his character is very old, but uh, is sort of kept viable by the fact that he has mechanical parts um, and so everyone calls him Grandpa Iron and uh, and despite the fact that he's a very very old man he's he's very much the kind of warrior of the group um, and, uh, and he's a lot of fun and, and of course the character uses a cantankerous old voice and everyone makes grandpa jokes throughout the session so that's why I like him Okay, well, no, seeing the time, are you okay with just five more questions? Sure. Five more questions, then. Uh, Colonel Hess would like to know the best way to break into the industry these days. Wow. Um, the best way, uh, you know, it always used to be doing things like writing for Dragon and Dungeon Magazine. Um now it might, uh, you know, it, it might be trying to hook up with a small publisher, uh, you know, like Wolfgang Bauer's uh, uh, Kobold Press, um, you know, is producing a lot of great stuff and and is open to to newer writers. I think, uh, for example, that that would be a way I would suggest. Okay, uh, Brady would like. To, this is a, is a uh, bit of a lengthy one. In regards more to setting and themes and tones, Monty Cook's world seems to be infused with magic. The lands themselves are teeming with it. What is the inspiration for this? This theme seems to pervade all his work. Where does it come from? What about his life influences, personal inspirations, informs his settings with so much of the magical? Oh, yeah, there's the biography channel bit. <laughs> Um, well, uh, yeah, we, um, uh, thinking about time limitations, I'll just try to answer that quickly um, and, and say that uh, I, I think along those lines, one of my big early influences was the, the work of, of Stephen R. Donaldson, um, who created a lot of magically infused, uh, I shouldn't say a lot of, he created one magically infused setting uh, with his uh, Thomas Covenant uh, books, you know, the land where, where everything was sort of, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't sort of wizards with stabs, but it, uh, but it was, uh, you know, everything was infused with magic and that kind of shaped the way I look at fantasy. Okay, uh, Clark Simmons would uh, like to ask you an industry kind of question, legality question. Uh, with so many of your games essentially offered as free illegal downloads on the internet, what are your feelings about this? Uh, do you feel there are any advantages to having your back catalogue readily available for free illegal download? Um, you know, obviously I'm not thrilled by it. Uh, <laughs> you know, a, a, a lot of people tend to think that uh, you know, it, it's okay to, to do that because 
you know, oh, this person makes a lot of money and they don't need the money or, um, you know, I mean, it, it is sort of literally if you are if you are taking a product that I've created, work on, published. Um, you know, it's not some big faceless corporation, right? It's just me. So you're you're you are literally taking you know money away from me. But um, you know, I also recognize that uh, that is a way for people to tr to try out products. Um, you know, I'd like to think that humans are altruistic enough that if there is something that they get, you know, via that route that they would then feel compelled to go and buy a legal copy of it. Um, but I guess my, overall my feeling is if I can produce products that people value and if I can make them easy enough to get at, you know, without a lot of restrictions and, and whatnot, uh, and I, I can, if I can price them so that, you know, my, my prices are not onerous, uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing all I can to make it easy for people to do things in sort of the upstanding legal way. And, uh, and, and lots of people do, right? Uh, so uh, I guess that's the way that works. Okay. Um, is it true that Bruce Cordell has moved to your company? Um, uh, yesterday, I think, Bruce said that he has given his notice at Wizards. Um, but what Bruce is doing next is a question for Bruce Cordell. Okay. And um, here's one that's been posted as the video has been uploaded. Uh, would Monty be interested in supporting or assisting the development of an Numenera animated series? Uh, I think that would be wonderful. Okay. <laughs> I don't know how else to answer that. Yeah, that no, no, it would be. Uh, and <laughs> to, to conclude, um, with most of the guests, I ask them to conclude with some kind of tale of fiction. Obviously, with time being a factor, I would like to posit a scenario to you. Okay. You mentioned earlier that a, a party of, of rogues and rapscallions within the setting of Numenera are in an age of exploration, they crest a hill and the thing they see on the other side in that valley just over yonder is nothing that they have seen before. It blows their mind just to look at it, they want to get at it, they want to touch it, they want to take from it, they want to experience whatever it has to offer whilst also being conscious of the potential dangers of doing so. So, our party has just crested a hill, has just peaked over the horizon, what does our party see when they look down into that valley? Um, what they see is an enormous, uh, transparent, perhaps glass, perhaps not, but transparent cube that is at least a mile on every side. And it appears to be, from their vantage point, filled with water. And they can see creatures that they've never seen anywhere else before swimming around in this, in this water, in this floating cube. Um, and at just, you know, because, because the water, the water is very, very clear, but it, you know, you, you get some opacity with water, but they can make out that at the center of this cube, surrounded by water and these dangerous looking creatures, there is, there is something that strangely looks like a tower made of stone uh, with windows, and there are lights on in those windows. That's superb, and um, thank you, thank you very, very much for your time, Monty no, Thank you. It was great to have you on here as a guest, and I hope to have you back at some point in the future, and we'll uh, check up on how Numenera is doing. That would be great. Thank you so much. Thanks to everyone for watching and for your questions as well. I think they were very good ones this time. So, yes, thank you again.